alcoholism is a chronic disease that includes problems controlling your drinking, being preoccupied with alcohol, and continuing to use alcohol even when it causes problems. The terrible potential of John Barleycorn, as we are on call with the Prairie Doc. Good evening, and welcome to On Call with the Prairie Doc. You may not recognize me. My name is Dr. Paul Amundsen, and I serve as Chief Medical Officer at Dakota Care in Sioux Falls. I'll be your host tonight as Dr. Holm is out of town on a well-deserved break. I began with Dakota Care in July 2007 as its Chief Medical Officer after spending 15 years as a family physician in Sioux Falls. I completed my undergrad studies at the University of South Dakota and my medical degree at Indiana University School of Medicine. Tonight, we're going to talk about alcoholism and the effects of alcohol in our society. In 2012, 25% of people aged 18 or older reported that they engaged in binge drinking in the previous month, and 7% reported that they engaged in some form of heavy drinking in the previous month. Alcoholism is a prevalent addiction in today's society, and tonight, we hope to better inform you of the health issues related to alcoholism the treatment process, and the hopefully the final recovery stage for these individuals. To help me tackle the topic of alcoholism is Dr. Craig Uthy from the Sanford Health System and one of my old partners in practice. Craig, welcome and tell us a little bit about yourself. It's great to be here, Paul. I'm a family physician. I've been in Sioux Falls since 1991 and I've had a full patient panel of, of uh, uh, patients and that includes taking care of babies in the nursery, delivering babies, uh, taking care of families and then eventually t helping people in the end of their lives when they go to the nursing homes. And I know you well enough to know that you, you have a special passion. One of the reasons we invited you here tonight is because you're passionate in helping people work through the challenges of addiction. Saying that, can you help us start just by helping us understand more about helping us to define the term alcoholism? What does that sure. truly mean? Okay. Well, if you put yourself in my shoes, if I see 30 patients in a day, 10 of those patients are directly involved in their life in some way with alcohol in their life. It might be themselves having an alcohol problem. They may have a boss that has an alcohol problem, a neighbor, a friend, a spouse, a child. It's prevalent throughout our course of our uh, practice. Of those, one out of 10 actually is at risk of having the disease themselves at, at, at that given time. So if I see 30 patients in a day, 10% uh, of them are actually having problems themselves. And unless we really try to find it uh, when they come in, most people do not come in saying they have a problem with alcohol. So defining alcohol, it's really a fine line. Some people say I can have um, one or two drinks an evening and it's good for my heart. That is true for some people, but for other people it's not. So it's a real gray line as to what's healthy and what's not healthy. We do try to screen people for alcohol disease, and there is yes, a science tell us, behind tell us more it. more about that. Um, so if a man comes into the clinic and they're a regular alcohol consumer and says, do I have a problem? We will ask them, do you drink five drinks? Five drinks would be five cans of beer, five shots of whiskey or liquor, or five glasses of wine in any one day. And if they say yes to that, that's a risk. That's at-risk drinking. Women have, or men have higher water weight, women have smaller water weight, so women can drink less alcohol and feel the effects of being uh, inebriated or having the toxic effects of alcohol. For a woman, if a woman has four drinks in any one day, or if she has seven drinks in a week, she has a 50% chance of having an alcohol-related problem in her lifetime. And it is a disease, and then we talk about it as a disease. Thank you. We'll answer your questions as well as they're called in. Should there be any questions, should there be more questions than we have time to answer during the show, we'll continue live streaming on the internet after the show in our after hours portion of our evening. Call us at 1-888-376-6225 or email your questions to ask at oncalltv.org. Craig, help us understand as well about the, the role of family members and the impact that it has. And I, I ask this because I have alcoholism in my family and I've seen the, the devastation it has and, and how much it permeates out uh, throughout the extended family. Well, there's really 
different kinds of alcoholism that we deal with. One is the alcoholism that we know that a patient comes in and they can't control their drinking. We know who those individuals are, we see them. They don't come into the clinic themselves very often, their family members will come in. And so what we try to do is help the family member first to understand the disease. I think of alcoholism as being very similar to obesity. I think it's very similar to being like diabetes. Um, if we start to identify it as a disease and treat it that way, patients are more apt to come in and want to get help for that. Uh, think of the person that's obese and goes on a diet. They lose weight, then what happens after a few months? They tend to gain the weight back again. It's the same way for a person that abuses alcohol. They'll quit for a while, but then they might relapse again. One of the problems we see with alcoholism is there's a stigma. We don't think of it as a disease. We think of it as being a bad person. And it's very common for the person who has the disease of alcoholism to relapse, and instead of coming in and saying, I relapsed and had a problem, they feel shameful, they feel guilty, and they go and hide, and they keep drinking. And that's a very common problem we see with alcoholism. And it makes it difficult for family members then, too, to try to help them out. especially. Very frustrating for those people. And I've, certain, I've seen that, and I've seen it as, as in my role at, at Dakota Care, where people will, will move in and out of, of the hospital for an acute setting for uh, detoxification. They'll go to a treatment facility, maybe sign themselves out after a few days that they've sobered up. And very frustrating on the family. Help us understand maybe some of the the newer treatment options that patients may have or just treatment options that, that people in general who are looking for help maybe through this show can find. Sure. Well, when it comes to, uh, we call them alcohol use disorders is what we call them now um, because people that are uh, younger in the age of 17 to say 25 years of age, Paul, they tend to binge drink and so the disease that they have is not so much the alcohol effects on the body like cirrhosis of the liver, things like that. There's just more accidents. So it's drunk driving, it's uh, domestic violence. People that are uh, inebriated are gonna then be more uh, prone to have accidents. So at the young age, we worry more about the injuries that can occur with alcoholism. We see alcohol um, poisoning. We see on college campuses, we see uh, in younger population, individuals die from alcohol poisoning because their body's not used to large amounts of alcohol and out of ignorance will have uh, significant health risks because of that. So trying to educate the population in the younger group is really important when it comes to um, binge drinking, we call that. As people get older, we see people come into my office and they're depressed. And, they, and I ask them, well, what are, you know, what are some of your, um, why are you depressed? And they'll give different reasons. And if we find out what they're drinking, if they're drinking, say, 14, 16 beers in a week, 20 beers, what is alcohol? Is alcohol a stimulant or is alcohol a depressant? And I think it's important that our audience is aware that alcohol by, by chemistry is a, is a depressant. It is a depressant, yep. So people will come into my office and say they're depressed. And we find that they're drinking alcohol on a regular basis. So do we give them a pill for depression or do we ask them to cut back on their drinking and see if the depression goes away? And it's very common for us to see people quit drinking alcohol or cut back on their drinking even, and their depression improves considerably. Um, they need professional help. There are counselors out there that are trained specifically in addiction, and so those are, those are licensed addiction counselors, and they're able to help provide people uh, who wonder if they're having a drinking problem, sit and identify it and see, is this drinking that I'm doing, is it a problem? Is it causing a health risk for me? Certainly identifying, having people being able to identify, being honest about their consumption. I think you and I both in private practice have seen people who underestimate uh, maybe consciously or unconsciously what they are drinking, family members who are covering for them. All those things, you know, really put a cover mask on, on the true problem. So, One of the big problems we see is that 9 out of 10 people in our society do not have a problem with alcohol. And so if they see somebody that's over drinking, what do they say to the other person? They say, um, just quit drinking. And they think it's just that easy. It's not. For one out of 10 individuals in our society, they have good intentions to quit drinking. They just find they can't do it on their own. And so that's the person that really needs to see somebody that's professional that says, this is a disease and you have every intention to quit drinking. But 90% of the people out in society they just think that you can just quit on your own when we know as a disease you're not able to quit. 
it's that person that really needs to get in and see somebody that's professional when it comes to helping treat any kind of an addiction, and specifically alcohols we're talking about tonight. Thank you. We know that people will go out to socialize and will at times drink too much to drive home safely. In Brookings, the Brookings Area Transit Authority offers an option to college students and community members to help make the streets a little safer. So Safe Ride is a program that provides transportation to um, people who have been drinking. It's also a method of transportation for those who are sober who don't want to ride with somebody who's been drinking. So it's really just a safe mode of transportation for anybody who wants to get from point A to point B safely. Um, the program operates for 31 weeks during the academic year and we run on Wednesday, Friday and Saturday evenings from 9 to 2.30 a.m. We have two routes that run. We have a blue route and a yellow route and the blue route is focused a little bit more on residential areas in Brookings, um, more towards the downtown um, area and then the yellow route is focused more on campus and the surrounding apartments. Each route is completed in about 25 minutes and students or whoever is riding, community members included, um, they have to be at a stop in order for the bus to come and get them. So we run off of stops um, and it is a free service for anybody who's interested. Uh, we don't check IDs because we want to make sure that people are getting home safely. So we're not judging if people are drinking or how much they have been drinking. We just want to make sure that they're you know, choosing to get a safe ride home. The number of DUI convictions has decreased um, by about 22 from 2013 to 2012. So we have seen very positive impact from providing the service and not that it's solely Safe Ride, but it's definitely nice to see those numbers decrease. It just kind of shows that Safe Ride is a valuable program that people are using. You know, having the program around um, and seeing the riders and seeing that reduction in DUIs, I mean, it just kind of reminds us that uh, our services is, is used. And as long as we have the riders, you know, it's one of those things, you don't know if it's a good thing or a bad thing that people are using the service. But as long as we see that reduction in DUIs, um, and we also see the reduction in the late night vandalism as well, because if students are, or students or community members are walking home, you know, sometimes property damage occurs. So as long as, you know, those DUI numbers are being reduced and um, we have riders on the bus, you know, we hope to continue to be funded and, and just providing that, that safe ride home to keep impaired drivers off the road. Craig, uh, this topic brings up an important uh, discernment we need to make about binge drinking. Obviously, having an occasional glass of wine with dinner certainly shouldn't be a problem for most people, as you said before, but let's focus more on the binge drinkers, those who may not drink very often, but when they do, they go way over the top. I mean, what, what risks are there with those people? Well, binge drinking is very uh, common, uh, Paul. We see it all the time. Again, most binge drinking occurs between the ages of 17 and 25. And people that are binge drinkers in that, that age group is at a much higher risk to develop alcoholism as they, become, as they get older. Alcohol is not a drug um, as opposed to, say, cocaine, where a person uses once and gets hooked. Alcohol, you usually take it and drink it regularly for a long period of time, and eventually a person starts to drink more. They become dependent on it. They develop something called tolerance. Tolerance is drinking five or six beers. If a person does that the first time they've never done it before, uh, they may black out. They may pass out. After months and years of drinking alcohol on a regular consumption like that, it's not uncommon for that person to not even seem to be inebriated, and yet they are definitely under the influence of alcohol in that situation. So binge drinking leads to um, dependence much more commonly than a person that does not binge drink. Thank you. Um, you talked earlier about uh, identification at the physician's office. Are there other areas that people can uh, receive uh, screening or diagnostic help? You talked earlier about some of the therapies. and. Yeah. Well, we're, there's a couple organizations in uh, our South Dakota uh, region, Sioux Falls specifically, there's an organization called Face It Together. They're out there trying to um, let us realize that alcoholism is a disease and approaching it as a disease is just going to help people to understand it better. They're doing something in that they're going to the employers and so a lot of the uh, employer assistance programs, health 
uh, wellness programs are trying to identify what risky drinking is. So if there is binge drinking going on, hopefully people will realize it and realize it's not just something that might be a habit. They might realize that it's out of their control and they want to get help. The earlier we can help people in this illness, the better they're going to be and the more likely they're going to be able to go a long period of time without drinking alcohol. Would you recommend that if people feel like there is a problem with themselves or a family member that they go to their family doctor mm -hmm. or primary care doctor first to try to yeah. get help? Mm -hmm. Yep, and again, when you come into a clinic visit with your primary care doctor, they'll take the time to identify what's going on, uh, objectively do some um, questionnaires that can identify if you might be at risk. There are blood tests that we can draw. If a person has elevated liver tests, if they have some blood cell abnormalities, they often can tell us that the alcohol has affected their physical health. And that's very helpful for us to say this is a medical problem and let's get you to the professionals that deal with this on a regular basis and get you into a kind of a program to get you to cut down or stop drinking your alcohol. You bring up a great point about the, the physical effects that alcohol has on the body and it's not just the the heart, the liver that some people think about. Uh, it affects the bone marrow, affects the brain function, many area, the kidneys, many area of the body that, that are impacted both short and long term by use of alcohol. And unfortunately, uh, this can be a very uh, slow, painful process for people at end stage liver disease caused by alcoholism too. Well, Something that we certainly want to try to prevent across the board. And that's why we say, uh, you know, well, isn't it healthy for me to drink two glasses of wine a night or one glass of wine a night? Um, research does show that, yes, alcohol can have a positive effect on a person's heart. Yet it's a two-edged <laughs> sword, a double-sided coin. There's a quick drop-off yeah. after yeah. one or two And drinks. so um, there's something called um, alcohol fatty liver. And if a person has regular alcohol consumption, the cells actually become steatoic, which means they actually um, become fat-filled cells and the liver fills up and becomes fat-filled. From there it becomes hepatitis, alcoholic hepatitis, where the alcohol actually causes it to be inflamed, the liver. And once it becomes inflamed so much, it actually becomes fibrotic and stiff and doesn't work anymore. Scars down. And that's called cirrhosis of the liver. Some people are susceptible to it, some people are not, but that's just an example of one of the diseases that we see with alcoholism. Interestingly enough, cancers have been associated with alcoholism, and that's something that's been fairly new. We do know that there's a link between oral cancers and esophageal cancer. 90% of oral mouth cancers, 80% of esophageal cancers are found in people that drink and or smoke. Um, there is an increased risk of breast cancer in women that drink alcohol on a regular basis to excess also. We have a question. I want to make sure that we get that addressed. Uh, we had a caller uh, bring in this one question. How often do major life events, major life stressors cause, you know, what would be considered normally social drinkers to increase their consumption to develop what then turns into a serious alcohol issue? Maybe it's a death of a close family member, loss of a job, divorce, et cetera. What a great question, uh, Paul. And what I would say that the answer to that question is, is the patient self-medicating? All right. So when a person comes into my office and they say, yeah, I have two glasses of wine every night, the first question I ask is, well, why do you drink that? And if they say, um, well, because I like it with my meal, that's one answer. If they say, it just, unwi it just uh, unwinds me, it relaxes me so much. When a patient answers it that way, they're self-medicating. They're taking that to try to unwind. If a person has depression, if a person has anxiety, um, alcohol may give them a false sense of uh, relaxation, of security, and unfortunately it does not have that effect long term. And the more a person does it, the more they become dependent on it, and before you know it, they're drinking regularly to try to, to, to self-medicate without even really realizing it. So if a person is drinking regularly, and we identify that in the office, we try to pare it down to fi find out why they are drinking the alcohol and find out if there's something else that we can give them for their depression for their anxiety. If it is grief from a loved one, let's get them into a support group uh, instead of having them sit at home and drink alcohol. And we obviously talked earlier about how alcohol is a depressant. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you think personally that, you know, living where we do in, in South Dakota in a rural, more rural part of the United States that, that our, our social structure is such that we are more likely to be uh, put into situations, especially younger, where alcohol is, is certainly not uh, discouraged and maybe even encouraged. 
Well, statistically, South Dakota, North Dakota, Minnesota are some of the highest per capita alcoholism rates in the United States. Now, why that is, we don't have specifically the answer for that. I think some of those social concerns play a role. There is definitely a genetic predisposition for alcoholism. Talk studies more have about been that. done. Um, they've done studies that show that there's a genetic predisposition. If you have a parent that has suffered from alcoholism, you have a significantly higher risk to suffer from alcoholism yourself. And that's one of the questions we ask. Does, is there any family history of alcoholism? And there tends to be a genetic predisposition to that, um, more so than the, the social aspects. Uh, they've shown where adopted children into homes. They're at much higher risk to drink if they, even if they're out of their home, if they had a biological genetic um, uh, family history than the social history. Both are at risk, but more the genetic predisposition. And it's interesting you brought that up. We had a, a call in just a few minutes ago asking that same question. If there's a family history of alcoholism, is the individual um, much more likely to develop a dependency on alcohol? in your opinion? Yeah, yeah, very much. I mean, the stats show that to be agree. that way. Yeah. What we're doing now is we're really trying to educate those that are in recovery. Recovery would be a person that has the, the disease of alcoholism, that they're not drinking at the moment. And so what we do is we say, we want you to educate your family, tell your family members, your children, uh, your grandchildren, they are at risk for this disease. And we want them to learn to either not drink alcohol at all or drink responsibly so they don't suffer from the disease of alcoholism. It's such an excellent point that to bring, as I was mentioning before, that this certainly permeates out the family. It impacts family. The family has to be involved in the, in the recovery, both short and long term, mm -hmm. as well as uh, helping understand how this impact may impact them in the future as well. Mm -hmm. We had one more question here okay. as well. Uh, remind us again, why do they call alcoholism, alcoholism a disease? Um, you mentioned that early on. Right. Uh, alcoholism is a disease because we do know that the brain chemistry is such that some people are vulnerable to drink alcohol and are not able to stop drinking once they drink. It's not because of something they think about, it's not something they want to do, it's something that's genetic. It's a trigger. Some of it's genetic, some of it is just the way they are wired in their body when it comes to the different brain chemicals that are in the brain. Studies have shown this to be true in animals, it's been shown to be true in humans through some of the studies that are done. And with that, um, we uh, know that people have great intentions to quit drinking and are not able to do that. We think because there's emotions involved with it that we should be able to control it. Um, people have the best intentions to quit drinking. Uh, matter of fact, I don't know of any of my patients that suffer from the disease of alcohol use disorders, alcoholism, that doesn't want to not drink alcohol. And yet with all those best intentions, there are triggers and there are um, all kinds of social um, triggers that will get people to, to relapse and drink again. Thank you. He's the director of Teen Challenge of the Dakotas, an organization that helps young men overcome addiction to alcohol and drugs, but Mike Gilmartin's own past has given him valuable insight into the problem of overcoming alcohol addiction. Well, to be very transparent with you, I had my own problems uh, growing up in southern New Jersey and, you know, I was in an uh, uh, Irish Catholic uh, large family that um, my family all liked to drink. So I grew up uh, watching my uncles, you know, abuse alcohol really and it seemed like they were having fun, you know, laughing and, and partying and all that sort of thing. and. And, uh, but, you know, uh, so I started drinking at an early age and that really affected me, of course, and set me back and, and uh, then I started to smoke pot and then I got into some other drug use and kind of set it aside when I first got married, I got married young, uh, but then, you know, those, those issues came back and uh, they really took a hold of my life and affected me and so I needed help really bad, I got to a place where uh, the AA program and going to those meetings and a couple secular treatments, it just didn't do it for me. It would give me temporary success, but it didn't give me permanent relief and, and victory, so to speak. So somebody told me about this place called Teen Challenge, you know, with a silly name that sounded like it was for kids. And here I was, a 27-year-old married man with a small business and four children. But I submitted because I was desperate for change. 
And so I went to Philadelphia Teen Challenge and it changed my life forever. So that's how I got involved. And after going back to the secular uh, business that I, that I was part of in construction, I just felt an emptiness and, an, and a, a, a real desire, a calling, if you will, to help other people. And I really love Teen Challenge for what they did for me. So that, that's what the beginning was, you know, and that's how we got uh, started with it. I think Teen Challenge is just a place that offers men hope and, and is willing to invest the time to get to know the person, to get to pray with them, to cry with them, to, to uh, train them and help them along. Uh, we help men find jobs. We help men, um, you know, get their teeth fixed. We help men facilitate taking care of all sorts of issues and problems that they have they just would ignore otherwise. But I think what I want to say is we're not in competition with other programs. We're just doing, we're experts in our field and we're doing this program and we're making a big difference. Craig, the piece we just saw I think, certainly reminds me that this is such a personal uh, type of condition, a disease. Uh, tell us more about it. Okay. When a patient comes into my office and they suffer from alcoholism, or if they just think they're drinking too much, I'll say it's like walking on a tightrope. Your life is just walking on a tightrope. You're teetering. You feel like you could fall off at any time. You're just, you're just vulnerable. There are triggers out there that a person has. There's cravings out there. People that come in that are drinking too much will tell me, I just crave alcohol. Uh, or they'll come in and say, you know, if I go to the grocery store, I, I just can't go in the grocery store. There's a trigger there. Or but they we go can't, bowling. We can't just live, people can't just live in a bubble. Right, right. They need support. So Teen Challenge is a, is a very good support. I think of this as, to the patient. I'll say, you're walking on a tightrope, and if you haven't gotten any help, you feel like there's no safety net underneath you. And that's dangerous. You feel very vulnerable. You, that's, it's a very, very scary disease to have when you have no support. And you don't know what you're going to do about it because it's such a devastating illness. And so what happens is we say, we need to find a, a safety net for you. So that might be AA. That might be Teen Challenge. That might be getting church involvement. It might be getting your spouse to uh, understand to the disease. Go to Al-Anon. Yeah. You get a hold of your clergy person, your pastor, your priest, to get some assistance. Um, you find support from other people that are in recovery. Uh, if a person has a lot of cravings, there are actually medications that are available that can decrease the cravings that individuals have for drinking. We will do that. Now, not everybody fits into that category. A lot of people, it's just a trigger. Um, I had a young lady come into my office recently, and she says, you know, I only drink about every three months, and when I drink, it's when I go home 300 miles away to visit my family. They drink. She goes, I will go home. I'll be there for a weekend. I don't remember the weekend. She goes, I go there, I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna drink, and she says, yet I get home, and I'll end up drinking beer and wine because that's what we do in our, when I'm home. It's, just, it's the social structure that they're involved it's with. It's the social part, and she doesn't remember it. And she says, do I have alcoholism? And I said, yes, you have the disease. I said, so why do you drink when you go home? She goes, that's just what we do. So she, that's a trigger. She either needs to not go home, and we want her to be able to go home, or she has to develop that safety net. She needs a safety net underneath her that's going to give her the support that she can go home, be in that environment, and not drink. Some people profess that alcoholism, like drug use, is something that's just people, those people just have poor impulse control. We had a caller call in from Castlewood wondering again, how do we call this a disease when it's basically something that's self-inflicted? I've seen this personally through my own family. I know that, that Everyone, people who can be very intelligent, physicians, mm -hmm. uh, scientists, people from all different walks of life, it affects everybody. So, now again, 90, tell me your thoughts. 90% of the population will say, you know what, um, you're drinking that alcohol, just don't drink that alcohol. It's that easy. Um, it is a disease. These, have, these are people that want to be just like the person that calls in and says, um, isn't it self-inflicted? It is self-inflicted, but it's self-inflicted because they have a disease that's not controllable. Okay? The person that has obesity and can't lose weight, they eat even though they don't want to eat. They want to diet. Um, there's actually a disease. When we say a disease, we mean that there is brain chemistry that 
has some triggers to that where they have all the desire not to drink and yet they drink. Um, now when you get people that understand that as a disease, it becomes much easier because they know what those triggers are, they will get the support and they'll say, okay, we have to be very uh, aware of this. The problem is, is people that have the disease are more shame-based and they're not going to go out and tell somebody, you know, I have this disease of alcoholism and it's very sensitive to me and I need your help to help me get through this. We just don't have that mentality right now in society. Um, we're trying to help that by educating people, by saying this is a disease, it's not just bad behavior. And once we understand that, we'll be able to help people much better through that. And we're going to see our recovery improve significantly because of that. Mentioning earlier that this disease passes through all different levels, all different socioeconomic classes, I know that you've been involved with what's called the HPAP program, right. mm -hmm. Health Professional Assistance Program. Okay. You and I in our jobs certainly have worked with uh, healthcare professionals who've been, who've been burdened by this disease of addiction. Uh, tell us more about that role, and because I think there's probably a lot of people who don't even realize that this kind of assistance program is out there for people who are healthcare professionals. Right, right. Well, in uh, medicine, we hold ourselves to a very high standard of accountability. And if we have somebody who has the disease of alcoholism that's a nurse, a physician, a pharmacist, a dentist, um, we don't want them out there practicing medicine if they could possibly be under the influence of, of alcohol. And so what we have done is we've established in 48 of the 50 states, South Dakota being one of them, a program where physicians, nurses, students, pharmacists, they can come to us and say, I have the disease of alcoholism. We will evaluate them, send them off to a treatment program where they get uh, rehabilitation. They have detoxification off of their alcohol. They go into rehabilitation. Once they have been clear of alcohol, they can go back to practice. Now what happens is they have to call into this program that we uh, monitor every single day, 365 days a year, where we can ask for a random drug screen. If they test positive for alcohol, they cannot practice medicine. Um, they can do this um, and be monitored. If they relapse, um, they either have to go to a treatment. If we find that they're just not able to overcome the disease, we do report that to their res uh, restricted boards, the Board of Nursing, Board of Medical Examiners, and they may lose their license because they would be at risk. Now, what we find in medicine is the accountability is so great and the consequences if they don't stay in recovery so is so great that the recovery rate for physicians is about 80 to 85 percent, which is very high. Whereas the general population, the recovery rate's about 20 to 25 percent. We're going to talk about that in a little okay. bit. Um, I do want to remind everybody that if you have questions, call us at 1-888-376-6225. You can also email us at ask at oncalltv.org. Find us on Facebook, just search Prairie Doc or at the Prairie Doc on Twitter. Let's go back to re recovery rates. Uh, you know, what do you think optimizes the ability for somebody to reach full recovery? Um, support is very important. Uh, the number one um, goal when we have patients that have the disease of alcoholism is to admit that you have the disease. When we have people that are drinking too much, 24 out of 25 times, they don't think they have a problem when they first yeah. come in, okay? Yeah. And- um, I was smiling because I was drinking when you were talking about drinking my yeah. water mm -hmm. when you were yeah. saying that. So. And so just to have somebody buy in, you know, in my office to say, you know, this is a disease and that we really would like to get you to some professional counselors, um, individuals that know the disease so we can talk about it. You can see what your drinking pattern is like and see if you can uh, buy in and uh, realize that this is something that it, you do not have control over. And once the patient says, you know what, um, I don't have control over this disease, I need help, that's 80% that's huge. Of, the, of the journey right there is when a person's able to say, I have a problem and I need help. That's very difficult to do. Um, but that's, that's where the success begins. And we see incredible results and it's getting better all the time. We're finding that the recovery rates are improving as we are identifying it more. Uh, people want to be well. Uh, we find that many medical conditions, again, like I've said, insomnia, heartburn, high 
cholesterols, diabetes, all of these chronic diseases that we have is made worse by alcohol. And so people really want to get better and are, we're finding that we have more and more resources. We try to get that safety net uh, underneath them to be more helpful. And think of it, if you were walking on a tightrope and you had a safety net, you'd feel much more comfortable than if you were walking on a safety on a tightrope without any support underneath you. Are the impacts that affect different organs, are those fully reversible, Craig, if somebody stops drinking forever? It varies from individual to individual and it varies from how long you've been drinking alcohol. And so pancreatitis, for example, that's inflammation of the pancreas. Um, people that drink alcohol on a regular basis are more apt to have pancreatitis. Some can get full recovery. Some it turns into chronic pancreatitis. Pancreas Which is, is a very painful, yep. debilitating yep. condition. And it's involved in making insulin. So when a person has pancreatitis, they may develop diabetes because of that. And so we find that it's very, very important to um, try to get to the disease as early as possible so that you don't have those long-term effects. Um, I'm happy to say that people that um, are in recovery from their alcoholism oftentimes feel so much better when they quit drinking that that adds up, that really adds to their ability to stay off uh, the alcohol. And I think a, a key reminder of all this is there's always hope, there's always optimism that people can get better. Mm -hmm. Saying that, Begun by a group of business people in Sioux Falls, the Keystone Treatment Center in Canton has been there to help over 20,000 people work to overcome their addictions. Sioux Falls businessmen formed a group called the Community Committee on Alcoholism and Drug Abuse and decided we needed a treatment center in the Sioux Falls area and found this area, which used to be uh, originally Augustana College and then Augustana Academy. And they brought in Lynn Carroll, who started Hazelden, which was one of the first treatment centers in our country, to be the program director. And that happened 41 years ago. We run about 90 patients. We have 122 beds. Sometimes we're full, but we run between 90 and 100 patients usually. We know that uh, a person's substance abuse problem isn't going to be cured in 30 days, 45 days, or even up to 90 days. That it's a day-to-day -day process. And a lot of research is suggesting that uh, as a CD counselor, as a chemical dependency counselor, we're advocating for up to five years of, of care. We also address mental health concerns. Um, and that there's a, a number of mental health concerns. We, we are uh, level 3.7 level of care at Keystone, so we do have access to uh, nurses, we have access to psychiatry, we have access to medical doctors. Um, so there is a psychopharmacology avenue that we can also uh, refer our patient to the psychiatrist that may be having a, a concern that could be aided through psychopharmacology. A majority of our kids do have some sort of co-occurring mental health condition too. Anxiety and depression are the biggest. Everybody is different. Sometimes when they have that epiphany moment and they say, yes, I have a problem, it's easy for them to slip back into that familiar, I don't have a problem. So it kind of moves back and forth between that. Um, it's two steps forwards, one step back. If, as long as they're making constant progress, we always want to see them moving forward. But it's not uncommon for kids to test the limits and see if they can use again and you know, see whether all these treatment counselors know what they're talking about. You know. Um, we see kids come back, to sometimes two, three times, um, and they pick up something different each time that will help them in their recovery. Regardless of how they got here, they can still have that, that light bulb moment where they realize, you know what, maybe they've got, maybe they got something there, maybe, there's, maybe there is a problem I need to look at. Oftentimes it's not the way we think it's going to be, you know. We can't go out and say, yep, there's a problem with drugs and alcohol. They've got to start looking at it yes, I have a problem with my probation officer, and this is what I need to do to correct that, where substance use is a part of that problem. I particularly like when the light bulbs go off, you know, that it's not necessarily connected to something I've said or done. Um, another thing that's real beneficial at Keystone is we, we really work on the therapeutic community, um, so it's not necessarily contingent uh, or that the progress in the patient only hinges on their work with their primary counselor or, you know, one of the doctors, that there's a a you know, microcosm of, uh, of what their recovery program could look like after they leave Keystone. There needs to be a power higher than Jack Daniels, and that's part of getting well, is discovering that.
Craig, we'd certainly be remiss if we didn't mention again what a great job Carol Regier does at Keystone. Uh, she does. All the thousands of people that they've helped. I know Carol, Carol very well, and they've done a great job at Keystone with many of the patients that I've dealt with over the years, and we appreciate all the work that they do for us. So, We had mentioned earlier that not everybody recovers, though. Not everybody, even going through these great treatment plans, uh, great treatment facilities are going to reach full recovery. Saying that, uh, you know, what other hope is out there for those types of people? Well, again, uh, alcoholism is not like pneumonia. You don't take a pill and it's gone. It's a chronic disease. It's a chronic illness that people suffer from. People ask me, well, how do I know if I'm drinking too much? Um, well, there's a, there's a few things that, that can come into mind. One is if a person feels like they need to cut back on drinking, just that they just think they need to cut back. That person probably uh, should go talk to their physician about it because there's a highly likelihood that that's, that is the case. Some people, if they're annoyed by family members that are saying, uh, you know, I wish you wouldn't drink so much, that's a warning sign for people. If you feel guilty about your drinking, that's a warning sign, you know, that you might be drinking too much and it needs to be cutting back. People that wake up in the morning and they've had drinking the night before and they, they drink in the morning to try to recover from that, that's another warning sign we have. People that have those types of symptoms really should get into their doctor and say, you know, this is what's been going on. Is this a problem for me or not? Are there red flags or warning signs that other people may notice? And I asked because we had an excellent call in from Rapid City asking if, if can non-alcoholics black out from drinking too much as well? Not well, just alcoholics, yeah. but those who are, we'll call them non-alcoholic binge drinking. Sure. Uh, blackouts are just uh, situations that develop from the brain being um, sort of shocked by the effects of alcohol on their, on their brain. And it's the breakdown of that alcohol in their system once it enters into their stomach and their intestines that leads to that. And so people will black out if they um, just drink two or three drinks and are not used to it. Doesn't mean they're an alcoholic, but that means that there's alcohol abuse. That alcohol they have consumed has resulted in a bad problem. Now, if that happens once in a lifetime, that's not a problem. But if it happens again, or again, that can really be a problem. And again, when a person blacks out, that's leading up to the point where it's alcohol poisoning and people die from alcohol poisoning. And we poisoning. hear about that knowing that we're here on, a, on an SDSU mm -hmm. campus talking about some binge drinking. Yeah. Unfortunately, occasionally we hear about college age students who die from, mm -hmm. from binge drinking. How does that, explain how that ha even happens? Well, again, people are not aware, they're not educated on the effects that alcohol has. It is a very dangerous drug. Um, obviously, drank driving. We all know those stories about a person that goes out, had no intention of driving. They did. Their uh, reflexes are diminished. We see that they're not alert, and that's when the accidents can occur. And we see those devastating effects in people that are not considered to be alcoholics. But again, when they abuse alcohol, problems can develop. Or if they black out and they can maybe aspirate and where they get vomit Absolutely. into their lungs and they can yeah. choke and die. I mean, those yeah. things happen. We've heard mm -hmm. accounts where uh, non-alcoholics, people who haven't developed the tolerance you're talking about drink so much that it, it's a literal poison to their body and they stop breathing sure. and, and will die. Now a person that's been dependent on alcohol for a period of time, Paul, that would be a person that drinks more and more uh, alcohol and they'd be, they have developed tolerance. I have patients that drink 24 cans of beer a day. And are walking and talking. And are walking and yeah. talking. Now if they tried to stop drinking that very next day completely, they'd have a risk of dying because of the withdrawal symptoms. People can have seizures and people can die from alcohol withdrawal. That's where a place like Keystone or a place like Tallgrass, Worthmore, all these inpatient treatment programs are very, very important because they help patients come down off of that alcohol in a medical way so that it's not so dangerous for them. And then once they've off their alcohol, they can get the rehabilitation to get them back on their feet again. Those people have fallen. And when they get through that treatment and realize that they have a disease, that disease is never going to go away. A person can be um, abstinent from alcohol for 10, 15, 20 years. I have patients that have been alcoholic for 20 years and have not had a drink for 20 years. And they say, no, I am an alcoholic. I have the disease. I will always have the disease. I'm just fortunate enough that I have not uh, had anything to drink for that 20 years. But they're always on their guard because they, they always know that could happen again. And I know you know, people, friends, uh, colleagues as well. And I think it's great to hear that, to hear them say that, because it helps to raise that awareness even, yeah. even more uh, across our yeah. society. 
and it is a family illness. I mean, that's that's for sure. Or um, um, in a business, for example, it it it. it crosses over the lines of your home into work and we see all kinds of costs that alcoholism has that are uh, indirect costs in the healthcare. Interestingly enough, we have found that people that have diabetes, people that have high blood pressure, people that have depression, people that have even asthma, those types of things, uh, if a person has an alcohol-related problem, the medical costs that are incurred for their diabetes or their high blood pressure is 10 times greater than it is for a person that does not suffer for the disease. So the disease has incredible economic ramifications Absolutely. too that we uh, really need to deal with and face um, full bore. Well, and, and from my standpoint, from being chief medical officer of a health plan, one of the things that we see is the cost associated with the people who are revolving in and out of the hospital, in and out of treatment facilities, you know, aren't staying consistent. And it, 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 a lot of it goes back to the underlying nature of the disease that you talked about, and, and it is frustrating. And, and as a society, we have, to, we have to raise the awareness to really make sure that people understand that it's, you know, this isn't a bad thing that we hide. What I find is, which is so encouraging, is when a patient comes in, we've identified the alcoholism, they say, I have a problem, I want some help, and you get the family involved, it is incredible um, the relief that you see and just the anguish that is resolved with families and how appreciative they are once they get into that recovery. It is like a new life they've had before. Um, we hear the term transformation all the time. A patient says, I was living in this state and I was dying and I got into treatment. I got the help I needed. It wasn't easy. It didn't happen overnight. It took months took weeks to months to, for us to get help, but it's amazing how our life has improved as we've been able to get away from this struggle of the chains of alcohol that bind us. Important question came up from a caller. Uh, this person's best friend's a longtime alcoholic, uh, been to treatment, no longer drinks the hard alcohol that I assume got this person down to that path, but now drinks beer. Is that, you know, is that, number one, is that a problem? Number two, what can this person do to help that individual understand that there is a problem still. Well, first of all, that the neighbors there for them, I think is very important, uh, is accepting them as a person and acknowledges that they have the disease. Um, obviously, we wanna get a person into recovery and not drinking alcohol at all. Um, I like to see people pointing in the right direction. Now, if a person has switched over to a different kind of beer or for a different kind of alcohol, the question is, have they accepted this as an illness or not? Are they seeing professional people getting help in this situation? Um, my goal would be that they're trying to move into drinking less and less and less. I'd want to know, are they drinking because of the craving they have? Are they drinking because of triggers that are out there? There might be medicines that that uh, friend um, could benefit from that would help them not drink alcohol as much. I think there are a lot of tools that are out there and if they're seeking medical help and they're moving that right direction, great. I'm all in favor of that. If they're trying to do it on their own and they made this transition, uh, I'm a little bit skeptical of that. I think they're making every effort they can. They're moving in the right direction, but I sure encourage them to get in and see their doctor. Let them know what they've done to try to improve and see if the doctor can help them even further. You bring up a great point that I wanna touch on quickly is, is alcohol content. Glass of wine, uh, 12 ounces of beer, shot glass of hard liquor, it's all the same amount of alcohol. It is. Yep. It's important it's 14 concept. grams of alcohol in a, in a a drink. So you can still be an alcoholic even though you're just drinking beer or just yes. drinking wine. So yes. saying that, we'll be right back after this. Ready to quit? Great, we're ready to help. Call a quit line to set up a quit date. Takes about 15 minutes. Next time we talk, we'll review free medications, triggers, coping, withdrawal. Takes about 30 minutes. Check in for two more support calls and we'll go over challenges, how to handle slips, and don't worry, if you're stressed or things get rough, just call. Then, bam, you're tobacco free. So take a deep breath. You can do this. We need to be aware that alcohol can be a blessing and a curse. Scientific studies have repeatedly shown that mild to moderate alcohol consumption, that's one to three drinks a day, accounting for person size, brings a significant health benefit for most individuals with reduced death rates from strokes, 
heart attacks, Alzheimer's disease, osteoporosis, diabetes, and even some cancers. Say it again, benefits. Death rates graphed with alcohol consumption becomes like a J-shaped curve. Somewhat higher death rate for abstainers, dropping 25% lower for the moderate consumer. But here's the problem. Then the death rate shoots up much higher for heavy drinkers because when drinking becomes heavy, it becomes very destructive. The problem is that the line between moderate and heavy drinking is a slippery slope. For some unknown reason, if there is any drinking for certain people, it turns into a binge. A young woman was admitted with aspiration pneumonia resulting from inhaling her mouth contents during seizures and then an alcoholic coma while laying in a pool of vomit. I came into her room on the second hospital day of recovery and found her crying while she was brushing her long ignored teeth. I can't forget the malodorous brown scum as she brushed and wept. A gentleman came into the hospital emergency room vomiting blood from bleeding esophageal varicose veins because he had alcohol-induced liver cirrhosis which dilated his upper venous system. We placed a special tube down his throat and expanded a balloon to put pressure on the veins which stopped the bleeding. Drinking and then bleeding reoccurred again a month later and that time he died. The sad consequences of alcoholism affect almost everyone. About 17 million U.S. adults have alcoholic use disorder, costing our country about $250 billion per year, causing close to 90,000 deaths a year, and accounting for the third leading preventable cause of death. It affects rich and poor alike, and when it catches hold, alcohol can devastate and destroy good people, and what's worse, all those nearby. Alcohol can be a blessing when in moderation, way more protective than any cholesterol-lowering drugs, for example, but it can also be a curse when in excess, more destructive than an unsuspected and ruthless poison. Be aware. Unfortunately, this brings us to the end of our show this evening. I want to sincerely thank our great guest, Dr. Craig Uthie from Sanford Health. Craig, uh, I know that we just skimmed the surface of this. Uh, if people need more information, how would they get a, how would they get a hold of you? Um, well, again, I would say get a hold of your primary care physician wherever you may be and get some help. And it's, it's out there. We uh, are learning how to deal with this disease more and more all the time. And there's always hope. Uh, I think you'll find that uh, okay. the treatments. Okay, we got to go, Greg. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> if you haven't gotten your flu shot yet, call your health care provider and make an appointment to get your vaccination. Remember. February can be the biggest month for flu in this part of the world, and it's not too late to vaccinate. Psychiatrist Carl Jung analyzed our topic like this. Every form of addiction is bad, no matter whether the narcotic be alcohol or morphine or idealism. Thank you again for joining us this evening. Dr. Holm will be back in his usual spot here next week. Until then, good night and please stay healthy. doctors will focus on women and their changing needs throughout their lives, some things that every woman and really all men should know about. Women's health, next time on Call with the Prairie Doc. Funding for On Call with the Prairie Doc is provided in part by... Avera is a proud sponsor of On Call on South Dakota Public Broadcasting.
Larson Manufacturing is proud to support on-call television as it continues to open doors for important medical information. And by the South Dakota Foundation for Medical Care, the Medicare Quality Improvement Organization for South Dakota. Additional funding is provided by Aberdeen Asthma and Allergy, Brookings Health System, Dakota Allergy and Asthma, Dakota Care, Dakota Dermatology, the Orthopedic Institute, Physicians Care Sanford Clinic Community Service Committee, and Swift Health Communications. Closed captioning for On Call with the Prairie Doc is provided by the generous support of Avera, Brookings Health System, and Fishback Financial Corporation.